My name is Nicholas Farrelly and this is the second episode of the Thailand in Crisis podcast and vodcast series brought to you from the Australian National University's College of Asia and the Pacific in Canberra. Today we're going to be discussing political and military affairs in the aftermath of the recent violence on the streets of Bangkok. I'll be joined by two of my academic colleagues, Professor Des Ball and Dr. Marcus Mietzner, who are both specialists on military affairs in the Southeast Asian region. If you'd like to leave comments for us, please do so at the ANU's YouTube channel, or otherwise you can join in the conversation at the New Mandala website. Our first guest today is Professor Des Ball, a leading expert on Thai security issues and a world-renowned authority on intelligence and defence matters. Des is a professor in the Australian National University's Strategic and Defence Studies Centre. Des Ball, thanks for joining us today. You've spent much time and energy over the past couple of decades studying Thailand's police and military organisations. Can you give us a bit of a sense about how they tend to fit together? And also, could you give us some idea about the general relationship between, say, the Thai military and the Thai police? The uh, Thai security system is, is very complex. You have a large number of groups of which the key elements are the armed forces, the army, the navy, the air force, uh, the uh, national police force and various uh, uh, branches and, and elements uh, of that uh, and a whole host of other sort of paramilitary elements and the relationships be between those uh, changes from time to time can be uh, very complex and even within a particular organisation or a part of an organisation uh, like the first division uh, of the army based in Bangkok uh, you will still get some dissenting elements. In other words, there's no consistency of policy, let alone political perspective, uh, right through any one of these organisations. The April and May 2010 violence in Bangkok has been attributed to various sides of Thailand's ongoing political conflict. The Thai government and its troops are allegedly responsible for many of the killings. Des, can you give us a bit of an idea about which particular units have been involved? The main units over those uh, couple of months from mid-March to uh, uh, 20 uh, May uh, on the army side uh, were essentially either Bangkok based units or ones near Bangkok and most specifically the army's first division, the King's Guard in Bangkok itself and uh, secondly the second uh, division, the Queen's uh, Guard, uh, based out of, to the east of, uh, of, of Bangkok. They were the two main uh, army uh, divisions. You had uh, several police organisations. The Metropolitan uh, Police uh, had overall charge on the police side, uh, but assisting them were elements of the special branch of the, of the police and uh, a couple of different uh, components of the special branch including those responsible for riot control uh, and then also to complete the peace, uh, police picture you had the uh, border patrol police and some of their uh, airborne special forces uh, units from uh, Hua Hin, Kai Naresuan who were also in uh, Bangkok at the time. So were there any obvious units that weren't deployed? Yes there were. Um, during the um, yellow shirt protests, for, uh, for example, uh, a number of Border Patrol Police units were brought in from the, uh, from the northeast, from Surin, from Buriram, from Udon Thani. None of those units were brought in uh, against the red shirts, which uh, might signify something about uh, what's uh, thought about their particular uh, loyalties. Border Patrol Police who were brought into Bangkok on this occasion came from Pitsanalok or from uh, Tark, or from uh, Kanchanaburi, or, or uh, from uh, uh, Hua Hin in the case of the, uh, the, the airborne uh, commando units. Uh, on the army side, uh, on most occasions when there's political troubles in Bangkok that reach the level of military intervention, uh, you'd expect in addition to the first and second divisions 
to see the 9th Division based in Kanchanaburi uh, on Bangkok's uh, uh, western or Burmese flank. And uh, there were no 9th Division uh, troops uh, involved this time. That may well just simply because uh, by marshalling all of the 1st uh, and 2nd Divisions uh, they had a sufficient number of troops in Bangkok anyway without having to uh, bring in the 9th Division. There is speculation that among the red shirt security guards who are often referred to as the black shirts that there are some specially trained elements perhaps drawn from within the Thai national security apparatus itself. Some have described these special elements as the Ronin. Uh, Des, can you give us a better idea about who these people might be? A little bit. Um, yeah, one part of them uh, I think are fairly uh, easy to identify. Uh, some of the rest remain uh, speculative. The, the, the part which uh, is, uh, is known for certain uh, is that they include uh, substantial numbers of Tai and Pran, uh, hunter-killer soldiers, uh, rangers, uh, based at Pak Tong Chai uh, near, near Karat. Uh, and you see those guys uh, acting as security guards around all the uh, red shirt uh, uh, encampments and, and protest sites. At different times there have been reported figures of up to as many as 400 to 500 uh, of those rangers from Pak Tong Chai uh, working uh, with the red shirts. Those guys have got a pretty unsavoury uh, reputation. Uh, in many instances uh, they're no more than just thugs for hire. Uh, the headquarters of that unit used to be at Pak Tong Chai and when that headquarters was disbanded uh, many hundreds of them uh, just were laid off in the Pak Tong Chai area and you frequently see them in, in, in Bangkok acting as security guards uh, but working for all sorts of, uh, of bosses. The, the other element uh, of the Ronin that I'm not quite so sure about uh, seem, uh, are those uh, more uh, expert, uh, more professional uh, people who are involved, for example, uh, in the sniper shooting, the, the shooting, for example, uh, that killed Colonel Ron Clough on uh, the 10th of, uh, of, of April. I suspect, though I have no firm evidence, that they're from the Special Forces Unit at, at Lopburi, the Special Forces uh, uh, Division, uh, Lopburi, uh, just northeast of Bangkok, uh, where they do have those uh, uh, many uh, sniper personnel, some of whom uh, are probably, uh, or undoubtedly, uh, closely related to uh, General Katia Saidang. Do you have a theory for why self-styled red shirt military commander Saidang was killed? Well, I think there are, are, are two uh, possible uh, reasons, uh, uh, that they're related. Uh, one is that um, he had been party to that ongoing violence between the most uh, militant part of the, the red shirts, those that included uh, the snipers, uh, for example, uh, on the 10th of April, uh, on the one side, uh, with uh, the elements of the second division, the Queen's Guard, uh, on the other side. They had been uh, involved in violence going back to the Songkran riots and uh, killings uh, in April of last year. Uh, it seems that they were the snipers working for Say Dang on the one hand uh, and elements of the uh, second division were at the centre of the violence on the 10th of uh, April uh, when in fact uh, uh, Colonel Ron Clow was, uh, was shot uh, in the head. Uh, and that the killing of Say Dang was in a sense part of this reciprocal uh, violence between those two units, the, the special guys on the red shirt side uh, and uh, some of Ron Clough's mates uh, on the second division uh, side. The second explanation though is, is that uh, uh, by mid-May uh, as the security authorities in Bangkok and particularly the army 
are, are giving consideration to how they're actually going to dislodge uh, the red shirts uh, from Rapture Prasong, one of the uh, issues that they would have had to confront uh, was how to get rid of uh, Sai Dang and the other uh, more militant leaders who they might have expected would have been uh, putting up a violent resistance and they had to get rid of them at the, uh, at, at the outset. So I think one uh, would, should also be looking uh, at some elements in the uh, army hierarchy which might not necessarily be in the second division itself, though that's probably where I'd be first looking. For many years you've remarked on the increasing professionalisation of those Thai military and police officers with whom you're in regular contact. Can you give us a bit of a sense about how they've reacted to the recent events in Bangkok? Yeah, let, let, let me say that I'm uh, not a person uh, who normally supports uh, army crackdowns of, of, of protesters. I, my sort of basic personal philosophy generally starts off from the, the other side, uh, supporting protesters against uh, uh, army and uh, security crackdowns. But in this case, uh, I think that the security authorities, including both the police and the army, acted by and large very professionally. I'm not sure that I can see what other choices that they had. They had to finally uh, move that uh, red shirt encampment in that central business area of uh, Bangkok. They did it in ways which I think really uh, minimised uh, the violence compared to what it what it could have been. We could have seen fatalities uh, in the hundreds if it hadn't have been uh, organised properly and, uh, and, and conducted uh, properly. I think uh, that within the Thai army, it's still a very bloated army, but there are elements uh, in some areas, uh, such as the Intelligence Directorate, the Operations Directorate, and some geographical areas like the Third Army uh, in the north and northwest which uh, are among the best in, the, uh, in Southeast Asia, in, in, in the region. Uh, the performance of the Third Army uh, area guys in East Timor, for example, uh, was the best of anyone's in, in, in Southeast uh, Asia. The Border Patrol Police uh, are the equivalent of uh, special counter-terrorist units and special operations areas uh, anywhere in the in, in the Western world, including the Australian uh, SAS, in the case of their uh, uh, Border Patrol Police Special Forces uh, guys, I think that they think that they did a a, a pretty good job uh, as well. Finally, and much more generally, what in your estimation could be done to try and bring Thailand's police and security forces back into this reconciliation process that Thailand's currently facing? Uh, what advice would you give to the Thai government if they asked you about how this system could be reformed? Well, this period of reconciliation is going to be difficult, there is no doubt about that. It's going to bring up uh, many, many challenges which are going to uh, inevitably involve the, uh, the security uh, forces. Uh, and over that longer term, one would hope that some very radical, uh, very dramatic uh, reforms, reorganisations take place within those security authorities themselves. Much of that depends on the police, which is uh, uh, the one area of uh, general security in Thailand which is, uh, has the poorest regard among Thai citizens, whether they're in Bangkok or in, in, in villages, the level of corruption that exists there, their inability to uh, perform basic police tasks. Reform of the police and, and uh, professionalisation of the police is, I think, the number one priority. Secondly, with regard to the army itself, it's far too top-heavy and it's far too bloated. You could uh, cut that army uh, in half uh, give it more mobility, better intelligence, better communications, better firepower, uh, and make it a much more potent force. You could get rid of uh, more than half of the uh, uh, general level officers, uh, and you could get rid of conscription, uh, which is an, un an unnecessary burden on the army now, 
uh, more than an actual uh, benefit uh, to the army. And you have this uh, uh, myriad of paramilitary groups uh, in Thailand which support one or other of the other security authorities and, and frequently uh, compete with each other and indeed sometimes actually fight uh, with each other. Uh, in, in the south, I'm sure that many of the uh, killings in the last half decade or so have been members of one of these groups killing other members, uh, killing members of uh, other groups, uh, often not for political reasons at all, but for uh, economic reasons, uh, uh, in, in involvement in criminal and uh, other illegal activities, uh, uh, etc. I would get rid of them uh, totally over the years and end up just with a, uh, a reformed police force for internal security, a uh, very uh, much transformed army, uh, navy and air force for external security, and the border patrol police taking over all of the functions of those paramilitary groups responsible for border security and have a rationalised structure of just those three organisations. Thanks, Des. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Nick. Our next guest is Dr. Marcus Mietzner, lecturer in Indonesian studies in the ANU's College of Asia in the Pacific. Marcus, great that you could join us today. Thanks for having me. You've been studying Indonesian politics and the Indonesian military for well over a decade now. When you look at the Indonesian experience over those 10 years and you compare it to the Thai experience over the same 10 years, what trends become apparent? I think what really becomes apparent is how important uh, coherence and unity in the civilian elite is and that is what Indonesia had in terms of their attitude towards the military um, and that's what's obviously lacking in, in Thailand. In Indonesia in 2002 the political elite decided on the framework, on a political framework for the polity through constitutional amendments that sidelined the military. And because the coherence within the elite was so strong, there was nothing the military could uh, do about that. So they simply had to accept uh, sort of playing now a second role, a secondary role in Indonesian politics because the Indonesian elite wouldn't allow anything else. Now in Thailand, obviously, uh, that coherence, that cohesion is lacking. Uh, there's a high level of fragmentation uh, in the elite uh, that you don't have in Indonesia at this point of time. How have the Indonesian police and military responded to the profound changes in Indonesian society during the post-Saharto period? Has the military, in fact, responded well to the new democratic system which is in place? Well, the military has really now focused on defence. Uh, in the past, um, there was a strong internal security role for the military that has now been phased out. Um, the police, on the other hand, has been taking over that internal security role and most importantly in the last five to six, seven years, uh, a counter-terrorism role. That is something that the military actually would like to have, but the police uh, is, is firmly in charge. So again, it all comes back to what kind of role the political elite actually allows the military to play. And at the moment, the political elite has decided that that role is external defense. Now, would the Indonesian military like to come back into internal security, into a more political role? Yes, it would, but uh, so far uh, it has not been given the chance to do so. In Thailand, there's a lingering sense that further military interventions into politics and even military coups are almost inevitable. Is that the case in Indonesia? Uh, at the moment, it's very unlikely that we will see a military coup anytime soon. But yet again, you know, with Thailand, it was the same thing. In 1992, there was the last coup, and then we've seen relative stability. Uh, in Thailand for 15 years and then suddenly the coup in 2006. So I wouldn't rule it completely out for Indonesia. The infrastructure for military intervention remains in place and that is the territorial command structure which very uniquely places the Indonesian military at every level of civilian governance. Now again, as long as the civilian polity is strong, democracy remains accepted in Indonesia, the military finds it very, very difficult to find an entry point uh, to stage a political comeback. But 
Should there be an economic crisis, a political crisis, a crisis of confidence in the uh, Indonesian democracy in the way that we see now happening in Thailand, uh, it's, it's perfectly possible. Again, very unlikely at this point, uh, but, but possible in the long term. Finally, Marcus, are there any specific lessons from the Indonesian experience that bear extra consideration in the Thai context? I think two issues are important here and again coming back to the importance of elite cohesion when it comes to formulating a stance towards the military. Um, the Indonesian elite has understood very uh, clearly that if they do not show that cohesion, the military will stage a comeback. Whenever there's fragmentation in the elite, the military comes back. Now, this is what Thai politicians obviously don't understand. I mean, they use the military in order uh, to fight their political rivals. Uh, the military in Thailand is an instrument for civilian elites rather than something that needs to be marginalized uh, from uh, the democratic polity. The second lesson here is that uh, it is very important to have um, a dispersed power uh, landscape uh, in order to create good conditions for civilian democratic control of the military. That means, in concrete terms, when Suharto left the scene, the very and single dominant figure in Indonesian politics was gone, power fragmented across the landscape, uh, there was now more power in the regions, in the parliament, in the government institutions, it was no longer concentrated in one hand. Now if you draw the parallels to Thailand. I think the role of the king here is very unique and it is in terms of civil military relations uh, a destabilizing factor because he has one factor uh, that holds authority uh, quite undemocratically uh, in terms of deciding you know, which coup is legitimate, which one is not, uh, which government is legitimate, which one is not. So very similar to the role that Suharto had uh, in uh, New Order Indonesia. That role, that single dominating role in Indonesia is now gone and one would hope uh, that in Thailand uh, something similar happens in uh, the near future. Thanks Marcus, wonderful to have you involved today. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us today and a very special thank you to our guests, Professor Des Ball and Dr. Marcus Mietzner. It was simply terrific to hear what they had to say on Thailand in crisis. Of course, you can leave comments for us at the Australian National University's YouTube channel or you can stop by at Umandala where we really look forward to continuing this conversation. Next week in the third episode of the Thailand in Crisis series, I'm going to be joined by another two of my academic colleagues. They'll be Dr. Tyrrell Haberkorn and Professor Hilary Charlesworth. They'll both be discussing human rights, violence and international law in the aftermath of Thailand's recent political strife. I hope you can join us then, but in the meantime, best wishes to all.